another country where uh, oil prices have an effect are Mexico. That uh, is the focus of our uh, next uh, panel. I'd like to invite our panelists up, Dr. Duncan Wood, uh, Dr. Concepcion Verdugo, and Eric Lecomte will be our moderator. Is uh, Eric with us? There he is. Hi, Eric. Welcome. Um, it's good to be with you today. Uh, as Tom mentioned, my name is Eric LeCompte from Jubilee USA. Uh, we've been working closely with global financial integrity uh, over the last few years as uh, GFI has really done groundbreaking and, and truly revolutionary work uh, on the issue of illicit financial flows. Uh, in terms of our organization, we approach the issue uh, rather specifically. Uh, we cut our teeth as Jubilee in the early 2000s, late 1990s, looking at debt restructuring. Uh, but the reality of it is, is you can't address uh, debt issues if you're not also dealing with revenue issues. And that's what brought us in the late 2000s into working more specifically on issues like illicit financial flows, uh, trade misinvoicing, uh, and also corporate tax avoidance. Uh, because at the end of the day, these issues have a, a very specific uh, impact on budgets. And from our perspective, uh, as a religious coalition working to end poverty, it has very powerful implications um, on the poor and the vulnerable. So today we're going to continue that conversation uh, on illicit financial flows, uh, looking specifically at Mexico. And we really couldn't have two better people with us uh, to be able to help us frame uh, and engage in this conversation today. Um, I know you have their bios, but I'd like to introduce uh, both of them. Uh, Dr. Duncan Wood, uh, who's the director of the, Mexi uh, the Mexico Institute uh, at the, the Wilson Center. Uh, and we'll also be hearing uh, from Dr. Concepcion, Dr. Concepcion Verdugo Yepes, uh, who's an economist at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, in a moment, Duncan's going to begin his comments, and part, uh, partly what he's going to um, share with us uh, is, is really looking at um, how issues around money laundering in terms of Mexico um, need to be addressed and really in what context they should be uh, addressed. Uh, we'll also hear some complimentary comments from Concepcion, who really is looking at the issues of mitigating risk, uh, as well as some of the root causes of these issues we're looking at in the context of Mexico. So let me turn it over to uh, Dr. Duncan Wood. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning, everybody. It was uh, uh, a great delight to receive the invitation uh, to come and participate at this event. Uh, it's an issue that we at the Mexico Institute have been following uh, for a number of, uh, number of years. We've published a couple of papers over the years on the issue of money laundering and U.S.-Mexico cooperation uh, on money laundering. Um, unfortunately, I am not the Mexico Institute's uh, expert. I just happen to run the, uh, the outfit. Eric Olson, who, is, uh, who does some work on, on money laundering, uh, is, uh, is dashing out to the airport right now uh, for a trip that I'll join him on later on uh, to Mexico's southern border. So I'm afraid you'll have to do with sloppy seconds as far as we can. Um, and I was quite happy to make the enormous journey from 1300 Pennsylvania over to here today. Um, some general comments, first of all, about uh, how U.S.-Mexico cooperation on issues of security have developed in recent years. Um, and I see that there are three defining factors uh, for how that has worked. Uh, first of all is the trust factor. Uh, traditionally, Mexico and the United States have structured their security relations in an environment or a climate of very, very low trust. The Mexicans don't trust the Americans because the Americans invaded Mexico and took half of their territory. That's the short version of the story, OK? Uh, US-Mexico relations for dummies. That has begun to change in recent years, as there's been the rapprochement, of course, brought on by the NAFTA, integrated production systems, et cetera. And of course, the major step forward that happened under Felipe Calderon and his war against organized crime. The trust that was built up during the Calderon administration from 2006 to 2012, however, was severely cut back when the new Mexican administration came in in 2012 under Enrique Peña Nieto, which was a return to power of the PRI, the Revolutionary Institutional Party in Mexico. Still one of my favorite party names around the world. You can be revolutionary yet institutional at the same time. The only better one in my experience was when Canada had the Progressive Conservative Party. I thought it was fabulous. <laughs> um, 
But uh, those trust levels were kind of scaled back, and all of a sudden, the United States found itself in a situation where Mexicans once again were questioning U.S. motives. What is it that the Americans want? And how do we structure our official relations so that we, on the Mexican side, can centralize and control every information, every bit of information that flows between the two countries? Now, of course, from the US perspective, when there was the rapprochement in the uh, early 2000s, and particularly under Calderon, there was a trust level from the US side as well, which was, we don't know who we're talking to. And time and time again, in conversations with US officials, you'd hear, I don't really know how much information I want to share with my Mexican counterpart because I don't know whether they are in fact part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Over the period of the Calderon administration, that changed a great deal and the United States agencies were able to identify reliable, trustworthy counterparts on the Mexican side. Not across the board, but they found key agencies and key individuals in those agencies that could be trusted. So trust is always going to be an issue. The second uh, factor, which I think defines all of this, is capacity. Of course, the, Mexico has faced a real challenge in terms of building up the institutional capacity, as well as the expertise, the human capital, et cetera, that they need to really uh, engage in a sustained fight against illicit financial flows and money laundering from organized crime in particular. And the United States and Mexico have worked very closely in recent years on trying to strengthen that institutional capacity. That's a factor I'll come back to later on. And lastly, of course, the changing security agenda. The changing security agenda between the two countries that, you know, back in the 1970s, 1980s, was very much looked at as being, well, we need to keep the gringos out of Mexican territory because look what happened last time, to, oh my God, we need the gringos' help to actually fight organized crime, to uh, now we have... Uh, organized crime, which is the major security threat to our country. It's no longer about territory. It's no longer about national security. It's about trying to deal with internal threats. And that, I think, has been a defining factor. And we'll continue to see that marking the relationship over illicit uh, financial flows. So that historical enmity um, and anti-Yanquismo, as they call it in Mexico, has been transformed under Calderon to a focus on the war on organized crime. Um, obviously, the Merida initiative in that, which has four main pillars. Mm -hmm. One is disruption of organized crime. Second is uh, institutional strengthening. Third is building resilient communities. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And fourthly, a focus on the border, uh, building a 21st century border. And of course, some of the, the bulk cash transfers that we see in the US-Mexico relationship actually occur right there at the border and efforts to try to, to shore that up. Um, Hurricane Katrina was also a major factor in strengthening uh, trust mm. levels between the two countries. As Mexican troops crossed over into the United States for the first time in many, many years, but on a uh, disaster relief mission. Um, the factor that we saw under Enrique Peña Nieto at the, at the beginning of the administration, um, the centralization, trying to make all security flows uh, in, sorry, intelligence flows go through one central window, a single uh, window for uh, in, intelligence sharing, has, has loosened in the past 12 to 15 months. And in fact, we're seeing a great deal more intelligence sharing. Now, we saw, of course, the great coup of capturing El Chapo, which was a major step forward for the bilateral relationship because it depended upon U.S. sharing intelligence with Mexico. And then we saw the escape of El Chapo, which is a huge blow. And once again, U.S. authorities are saying, well, who can we really trust in the, uh, in the Mexican government? There's a great deal of uncertainty over the scale of, of drug money going to Mexico. Uh, I think it's one of the things that Concepcion is going to talk about. Um, you know, Mex some Mexican officials have estimated $50 billion a year. Others have said, some analysts have said between 19 and 39 billion. The NDIC says that uh, Mexico is the primary placement uh, country for US dirty money. The State Department estimates 19 to 29 billion a year from drugs money. Um, we see, of course, the, uh, the Wachovia case from a few years ago, where there was uh, a forfeiture of $110 million. Now, that was over a number of years, but it gives you an idea of, of, of the scale um, of, of money that is moving from the United States to Mexico. And of course, it moves in multiple ways. You have electronic transfers, bulk cash, in-kind, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, you have the extra added complication of the massive amounts of remittances from migrant communities in the United States back to their home communities <coughs> in Mexico. Um, and you know, latest estimates put it in the low 20 billions uh, a year. 
Um, <laughs> most of that is, of course, legal, but it complicates the, 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 the relationship, or I'm trying to understand the scale, just by, because we don't know how much of that is not, is not legal. How much of it is, is sort of through a straw transfer system uh, of many small transfers? U.S.-Mexico anti-money anti laundering efforts in recent years, well, of course, they're both signatories to major international agreements. We've seen a close cooperation between the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network in the United States uh, and Mexican authorities. In fact, Mexico is the only other country, according to my sources in the Mexican government, uh, where uh, uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network has uh, uh, an, atta an, atta an attaché. And, of course, the Unidad de Inteligencia Financiera, which is the Mexican counterpart, um, has attaches in the United States. A um, uh, financial uh, crimes enforcement network also has the Southwest Border Executive Steering Group, which focuses on uh, financial, illicit financial flows across the Southwest border. We've seen increased training and technology transfers through the Merida Initiative. Um, we've seen agreements between state attorneys general, uh, as well as the financial uh, crimes enforcement network, um, and the Mexican version of the, uh, the SEC, uh, the CNBV, or the Comisión Nacional Bancaria de, de Valores, um, which is the uh, regulatory authority in, in Mexico. And we've seen uh, close cooperation on cr uh, criminal investigations. The Wachovia case was a result of cooperation between the Mexican Attorney General, the uh, Unidad de Inteligencia Financiera, and DEA. Um, Mexico itself has passed three major pieces of anti-money laundering legislation in recent years, 2010, 2013, uh, and 2012. Um, and the uh, finance ministry, the, SA, the, the Hacienda in Mexico, and the bank regulator um, have uh, put in place uh, new know your customer uh, regulations and standards. I'll just say a couple of comments to close and then hopefully we can come back in the Q&A. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to understand the extent of the impact of uh, illicit financial flows in the Mexican economy is because of the scale of the bilateral economic relationship between Mexico and the United States, not just the remittances that I make, mentioned earlier on, but now, of course, trade levels between the two countries are up over half a trillion dollars a year. That's a massive growth from the uh, origins of the NAFTA. We're now seeing you know, more than a billion dollars a day flowing between the two countries. We also have to put in the, uh, the factor that the Mexican economy is much, much bigger than it used to be. And so these illicit financial flows, although they're big in absolute terms, they're very small in relative terms compared to the bilateral relationship mm -hmm. and to the Mexican economy. And lastly on that, the Mexican uh, informal economy is enormous. I mean, by some estimates, it's as much as 60% of GDP. So we actually don't know how, how big uh, the, uh, the informal economy is. It's very difficult to actually work out how illicit financial flows play into that. <laughs> And when we're talking about trying to stop the flows, how do you actually distinguish between money laundering activities and the spending of that money as it comes back into Mexico? How do you, and maybe other panelists have dealt with this, but how do you actually seize uh, monies that are being spent, let's say, on a night of drinking with your, with your friends in the organized crime group, or a couple of hours with some Eastern European dancers in a Mexican strip club? I mean, how do you actually deal with that kind of money laundering, which is going through the informal economy? Um, and of course, the last factor, which is most, most of the profits from drug money get reinvested into the operation. Mexican drug cartels are sophisticated organizations. They're businesses. They're transnational criminal businesses. And so they're investing not just in product, but they're investing in new communication transportations. They're investigating in human capital. I mean, if you look at the accounts of some of these drug uh, organizations, it's fascinating. Some of them are paying therapy for their hitmen. And you actually see this in their accounts. It's fascinating. You know, two hours with Dr. So-and-so because this guy had post-traumatic post stress after killing a few guys. That's the kind of thing which, uh, you know, you really, really begins to complicate it when you think we try to shut things down. I will end there with just the question. If we're talking about organized crime and if we're talking about, uh, you know, money laundering, is in fact stopping the money the answer here? I know the focus of the study has been on development issues. But I would say that both development issues and organized crime would be better served by an overall strengthening of institutions in the country. Thank you. Sorry, I Thank went over you, a couple of minutes. No, that's fine. Concepcion. Um, good morning. Thank you. Well, first, let me thank uh, Mr. Baker and his team for organizing this highly topical conference and uh, for inviting me to participate. 
Today, I will talk about potential sources of illicit flows in Mexico and the integration of these flows in the financial system and, and the economy. Uh, based on academic studies and official reports, let me give you an, a snapshot of how complex and dynamic potential illicit flows from and to Mexico can be. Mexico is a major drug producing and transit nation. It has powerful drug cartels involved in the production and trafficking of drugs, including transshipment of cocaine from South America to the United States and Europe, which are the two main drug trafficking consuming markets. The largest source of money laundering and illicit funds in, Mex in Mexico is believed to be associated with illicit drug trafficking. However, other illegal activities such as human trafficking, extortion, corruption could also be generating illicit flows. The complexity of money laundering in Mexico has increased as criminal organizations expand their influence and develop new methods to launder the, the, these illicit funds, including through linkages with other criminal uh, groups based in other countries. According to the 2008 uh, Mexico's Mutual Evaluation Report, no estimates are available of the level of money laundering in Mexico originating from drug trafficking and other proceeds generating crimes. We understand that attempts to generate such estimates may have been hindered by the difficulty to develop an appropriate methodology and by insufficient reliable empirical evidence. It is not possible to obtain reliable estimates on the amount of drugs proceeds generated in consuming countries that are transferred directly to Mexico. Money laundering in Mexico is believed to be carried out using a variety of schemes and institutions. In the placement a stage of money laundering, bull cash, uh, smuggling from the United States, including through the use of personal carriers, mules, has traditionally been believed to be commonly used. However, provided that Mexico has established and implemented regulations to limit the deposit of US dollars in cash within the country's financial system, this scheme could become less attractive. For the specific case of illicit proceeds being sent in cash from the US to Mexico, once they enter the later country, illicit funds can be structured and integrated into the local financial system and the economy in different ways. Some of these funds may be re-exported to other countries or to offshore financial centers. For example, in 2008, a case involved the seizure of millions of US dollars in cash being exported from Mexico to Colombia via Panama. A major Colombian drug trafficker based in Brazil was arrested and disclosed the use of a network of legal entities to launder U.S. source drug proceeds via Mexico. Operation TACO involved the laundering of 236 million euros in drug proceeds from Spain to Mexico through the export of precious metals by a network of Spanish, Colombian, and Mexican nationals. These cases illustrate the magnitude of illicit resources controlled by criminal organizations as well as the complexity of their international operations. Money laundering affects a number of financial intermediaries including foreign currency operators, licensed casas de cambios, asnetros cambiarios, money remittance uh, firms and banks. While the transfer of remittances through established financial intermediaries can reduce the incidence of cash smuggling, the volume and speed of these electronic transfers also create important money laundering risk manage and management challenges for financial institutions. Criminals are also believed to use offshore financial centers to launder illicit funds. They, tra they transport cash using personal couriers. In some cases, according to Mexico's mutual evaluation report, Funds originated from the U.S. are transported directly to Panama, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Colombia. Some investigations include cases against political exposed persons accused of corruption and who have invested large sums of money in the coastal zone of some Mexican states. Some political exposed persons have been using from men and trusts to hold their property. 
The integration of illicit funds in the Mexican economy and the financial sector take many forms. Uh, this includes, for example, the purchase of uh, luxurious automobiles and real estate. Criminals also use bank accounts to launder their funds, including through structuring transactions and make significant investments under the names of family members, adopting methods and structures similar to those used in the business and industrial sectors. What I have described in general shows the complexity of the sources, drivers, and patterns of illicit flows in Mexico and the difficulty to, to get a clear understanding of the scale, the direction, the motivation, and the impact of illicit flows from and to Mexico. In this regard, I want to emphasize that the complexity of calculating the flows associated with illicit and criminal activity should not be underestimated. In this context, um, in 2011, uh, Peter Pedroni and I, we analyzed the illicit drug trade in the case of Peru. This pointed to the transnational nature of most illicit drug transactions, the, difficult, the difficulties we found uh, with attributing uh, profit shares to individual jurisdictions and in general uh, how difficult it was to, to implement the methodology and to manage the data that we are using in Peru. All of, all of this was hampering the assessment of the size of the flows and their economic impact. Um, in particular, available methodologies are unable to disentangle, to unpackage the flows associated with these interrelated in criminal activities. Drug production is related to arms trafficking, money laundering, smuggling, and corruption, especially when they take place across one or more multiple borders, which is the case of Mexico, and the case of Peru, and the case of Colombia. This inability to isolate these specific flows results in significant levels of double counting. Of these categories, the outflow of the proceeds of corruption would appear to be the closest to the core concept of illicit financial flows, and indeed represents a serious problem with significant negative development impact. However, conflating that with the proceeds of drug trafficking deriving from transactions in criminal markets and outward capital flows, some from legitimate economic justifications, in my opinion, raise a lot of analytical difficulties. In the case of Mexico, uh, we should welcome the fin finalization of the national risk assessment, which is an important tool that helps countries to assess their money laundering and finance and the financing of terrorism risk. A critical component involves estimating money laundering threat being the proceeds of crime that need to be laundered. You may ask why it's important. As we all know, the implementation of regulatory standards, global regulatory standards and economic and trade sanctions has been enhanced in recent years, including due to major economies' interest in increasing the transparency of financial transactions to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing risks. The implementation of the risk-based approach to IML measure is a key feature of the FATF standard revised in 2012. This requires countries to establish what the country's risks and contexts are to understand risk and build their system on that basis. Mexico will be evaluated against the new FATF standard in 2016. This is a great opportunity for Mexican authorities to show the level of to which they have identified, assessed, and understood the money laundering and terrorist finances risk for their country. Based on this IML CFT national risk assessment, in terms of which countries identify and rate higher or lower their risk, they should ensure that the IML CFT regime adequately prevents and mitigates such risk. Such an IML CFT national risk assessment, which I understand is in process of being <coughs> finalized and without prejudging the results of the national risk assessment, could help Mexico in the following. First, to implement further effective measures to dissuade the cross-border transportation of cash of illicit origin and use. Could also help to implement supervisory and other controls mechanisms in place for preventing that financial institutions that provide money services 
cash businesses to banks, like banks, money remitters, casas de cambio, centros cambiarios, casas de bolsa, that are used for, for illicit cash movements, are improving. In particular, um, country need to discuss the supervisory arrangements for the thousands of centros cambiarios. Also, the country, after the national arrest, uh, assessment, uh, should fully implement IML-CFT risk-based supervision frameworks across all financial sectors based on money laundering terrorist financing risk identified by Mexican authorities. The country should also take steps to sub subject domestic, domestic politically exposed persons to enhanced customer due diligence and require financial and non-financial institutions to take reasonable measures to establish the source of funds and wealth and to su subject political exposed persons who have been entrusted with public functions to the same enhanced due diligence measures as foreign political exposed persons. Thank you. Thank you, Concepcion. So uh, we'd like to open it up for, uh, for questions and comments um, for our two panelists. And actually, we'll, well, we're starting to pass that around. I do have a question I want to throw out to, uh, to both of you. Um, you know, I was struck by uh, some common themes in, uh, in both of your presentations. Uh, in particular, um, I, I know, uh, Concepcion, you noted how complex the situation is. and. Um, you actually noted, Duncan, that when we're looking at Mexico, there might not be as much of an illicit financial flow problem, but an institution building problem. Um, I guess in, in terms of the money laundering situation and how that is unique or not unique to the Mexican situation, um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to ask you to perhaps reiterate, if we are interested in curbing illicit financial flows, what are, are the one or two primary institution building things that should happen right away within the Mexican context? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm asking you just to prioritize, lay out what those one or two things are. Let me begin with a, with a bright spot of what's happening in Mexico that gives us some hope on what, what can be built. And that is that uh, right now, conversations about the rule of law in general dominate the Mexican news. They dominate... Uh, sort of the conversation about Mexico internationally, and it's not just about drug cartels now. Now it's about politically exposed persons. Now it's about governors of states in Mexico. It's about, of course, as high as the president himself. You know, we had a very uh, considerable conflict of interest scandal at the end of 2014, which is dragged on throughout this year, involving the president's wife, who, uh, you know, her famous Casablanca, her White House in a very ritzy area of Mexico City, which appears to have been given to her or sold to her at a very, very low rate of interest by a major construction firm which has received huge contracts both from the state of Mexico where uh, the president was governor beforehand and now from the government of the country of Mexico. Um, we've seen other corruption scandals or conflict of interest scandals since then and we're all aware that there are many other scandals that are bubbling just underneath the surface and the information, the intelligence hasn't really been gathered yet. But what this has sparked off in Mexican society is a sense of outrage over corruption, conflict of interest, um, and a desire on the part of civil society. And by civil society, I mean both the protesters in the street and think tanks and NGOs who are working behind the scenes to really try to gather the information that we need to have a clear idea on, uh, on corruption uh, and the scale of corruption throughout uh, Mexico. The recent successes of discovering or uncovering corruption, first of all in Brazil, the Petrobras scandal, and now in Guatemala, have caused a huge reaction in Mexico. Mexican civil society has said, look, if a country like Guatemala can put their president in jail, or their ex-president, I guess, in jail, <coughs> why aren't we doing the same thing? When they saw what happened with the Petrobras scandal, they said, well, we've got the largest uh, national oil company in the Americas. What's going on with that? We all know there's corruption within Pemex, but we don't know the scale of it. We don't know any of, many of the details. There are corruption scandals all the time in Pemex, and people are prosecuted, and people are put away, or well, they're not. But 
they've always been small cases, you know, involving, you know, maybe a couple of million dollars. Nothing really big, nothing like the Petrobras scandal, and we're waiting to see what happens with that. So that's a real bright spot right now, is that society is mobilized, society is focusing on this, and in particular, civil society think tanks like Mexico Evalúa, um, which is a very, very important uh, uh, civil society organization, which really tries to push the government towards higher levels of transparency. Uh, Transparency Mexicana, which is the Mexican branch of Transparency International, also doing a good job. And not just on the critical side of things. Uh, Transparency Mexicana is working with, uh, for example, the national publicly owned electricity utility, the CFE, to try to increase the levels of transparency in contracts that are signed by the electricity uh, utility. This is a very positive thing. And I think that if we can build that capacity within civil society, and I know that that's, that's certainly part of US-Mexico co- uh, collaboration, is strengthening you know, the community in civil society. At the same time as we strengthen the enforcement side of things, then we'll be making progress. And just lastly, before I uh, you know, turn it over to, to Concepcion, we had a, a research fellow with us this summer at the Wilson Center at the Mexico Institute who was trying to understand why anti-corruption efforts have been more effective in the United States than in Mexico. And of course, there's, there's a myriad of reasons. But after conversations with many different government and civil society organizations here, he came down to sort of three factors. He said, one, a strong and independent judiciary. Now, Mexico, of course, is going through a massive judicial reform right now. The deadline for that implementation is 2016. They're not going to make that deadline. And the implementation has been very uneven across the country. But that's, a, that's one institution where we need to work more on. Second, a strong and independent media or press so that you actually are able to harness the outrage of civil society and to really expose. So you need investigative journalism. And there's not a strong tradition of investigative journalism in Mexico. In fact, one of the, the scandals of this year was Carmen Aristegui, who, was the, who exposed the, the White House or the Casablanca scandal, was, was forced out of her position at one of the networks. Uh, and it's widely suspected there was pressure from the government. Mm. The third factor um, which he points to, Marco Fernandez points to, he says, is a professional public service. This is one of the factors that I think we forget about a lot of the time when we focus on corruption and uh, and rule of law in general. Mexico's public service, not just at the highest levels, but quite far down the chain, is highly politicized. And so you see massive turnover. And you also see that those people are dependent or beholden to their superiors way up the line for their jobs, which means that they are much less likely to turn against them. They're much less likely to expose them. And so work that has been underway in Mexico for over a decade now to try to professionalize the public service, in fact, has achieved very, very little. And that's a factor that I think we should, uh, we should focus a little bit more attention on. Sorry for my extended Thank you, answer. Dr. Duncan. And so, Sean. Um, well. I, I fully agree with uh, Duncan. Um, I will propose three types of measures. First of all, to strengthen the IML CFT regime, to strengthen and to make the system effective, the second will be to, to take action on the anti-corruption side. And the third is to finalize the judicial reform mm-hmm. that the Mexicans are undertaking. Uh, in June 2015, uh, we published a working paper on the crime and the economy on Mexican states that I have uh, co-authored with Peter Pedroni and Ching Wei Hu. And we, we have recommended the country to undertake the judicial reform, because this, this, this is very important if you want to be effective in your fight against crime in the country. I'm really brief, but I mean, these are the, 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 key, the key messages for the country. I mean, uh, and, but I'm not sure whether having a strong IML regime, anti-corruption measures, and judicial reforms are enough. Mm-hmm. I think that you need to, to have strong institutions and and to improve national coordination among the institutions in Mexico. I think this is key for Mexicans to be all in the same path. I mean. Thank you. So I think we have a few questions from the audience. So we're here first. 
Thanks very much, and uh, thanks, obviously, to Concha and to Dr. Wood uh, for their presentations. My name is Jose Luis Stein. I am currently a legal counsel at the IMF, but I would like to speak um, uh, with my previous hat as a representative uh, of uh, the Mexican government for AML-CFT issues, both at the Calderon and the Peña Nieto administrations. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Wood is obviously a very well-informed uh, person, and he has provided a very comprehensive and clear uh, picture of uh, a part of the situation with regards to, 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 to Mexican and U.S. authorities. I would only like to focus on the AML-CFT efforts in particular, which is the area w of which I'm aware of. And in that regard, uh, highlight that as Dr. Wood has, uh, has explained, uh, the relationship during the Calderon administration was very strong. But in that particular uh, topic during the Peña Nieto administration, I can tell you that it has actually strengthened. Uh, and I can give uh, just a few examples. Uh, the amount, the number of um, policy initiatives has increased. The, number, uh, the amount of information sharing has increased. And for the first time uh, under the Peña Nieto administration, there was actually joint investigations and uh, successful prosecutions. And uh, that was actually recognized by the Egman Group, which is uh, the one that uh, uh, assesses a few uh, cases per year and determined that uh, there was a joint case Mexico-US which was the best case for the 2013. Uh, another issue was uh, raised by Concha in the sense that uh, governments have to focus, and this includes the Mexican government, on the institutions. Uh, and in, in that regard, I know that there has been a, a, a strong attempt to, to, to keep a, a, a public um, civil service within the AML-CFT areas, at least if not at the first level, at the second and third levels. Uh, there's also a big effort to comply with the FATF recommendations, and that includes a, a working on a comprehensive national risk assessment, and a, which should be finalized soon. Last, I would only like to highlight the important uh, work that is being done by, by global financial integrity. Uh, there, there, there might be some objections uh, on, on towards the methodology by, by some parties. But uh, the reality is that they have taken a very complex and important task, which is trying to uh, understand in, in numbers, which is the impact of, uh, of money laundering, and therefore the importance of addressing that issue. Thanks. Great, sorry. I think the microphone's coming down. Um, what we, DEFCAR, uh, Chief Economist, GFI, uh, what we found that um, in the case of Mexico, uh, trade misinvoicing is one of the major drivers of illicit flows. Uh, to what extent, uh, since, you know, uh, trade-based money laundering is a concern, uh, to what extent, I'm not sure about the details of the AML-CFT, to what extent does the AML-CFT regime address this issue of trade-based money laundering as far as Mexico is concerned. Can you, can you enlighten us on this, on this uh, issue? Um, the, the IML regime has a number of recommendations that the country needs to be compliant against. Um, in my understanding, and Jose Luis, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are some recommendations in place like know your customer um, that n need to be implemented, not only in financial institutions, but also in non-financial institutions. And in, a, in particular, the recommendation five, what, what was the previous recommendation five, where everybody doing a transaction in the, in a, with a financial institution or non-financial institution needs to provide some information about what the person is doing, what's the origin, what is the source. And I think this is the most important uh, recommendation no? to help 
fighting the trade-based money laundering. Uh, maybe Jose Luis, you want to add something on this? And I, and I apologize because I didn't hear the, the full question, but I understand it's related to trade-based money laundering. I mean, in that, in that regard, uh, what uh, Concha was mentioning, on uh, th there is definitely a know your customer uh, due diligence uh, regulations in place in terms of the FATA. And there has been an important effort, for what I understand, from the different uh, supervisors to make sure that the regulated entities are implementing them. Uh, and I can also say from an operational side that there's a very close communication between the relevant authorities, such as the FIU and the tax authority, to uh, address trade-based money laundering. Because indeed, it is one of the uh, main uh, typologies that is being observed in the country. The reason I ask is the IMF provides technical assistance. The IMF provides technical assistance on customs reform. Mm -hmm. uh, if trade misinvoicing is, and I'm sure it is a major problem in, in Mexico, could not the IMF take a more proactive approach and say that there are gains to be made uh, from Mexico implementing comprehensive customs reform uh, as, uh, you know, in order to, uh, to attack this problem of uh, illicit flows. So the fund is directly involved in this area. Well, I think that uh, in 2016, uh, the fund will be evaluating Mexico and if this problem is raised during the conversation of the discussion or the evaluation of the country, uh, probably the IMF or the assessors will raise these recommendations. And uh, if it's needed, the, the, the IMF could provide technical assistance to the country in this area. But I think the, the, the discussion needs to be taken place during the mutual evaluation report. I mean, probably the assessors will see that the trade-based money laundering is one of the major drivers. And then they will discuss whether the, the, the country has the mitigants in place to address this. And it's, it's the moment. Also, the assessors will see whether in the national risk assessment, uh, trade-based uh, trade money laundering is included and what's the scale of the problem. So I think it's the moment. It's, 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 it's upcoming, so, so. Can I ask a very ignorant question about the trade misinvoicing? I mean, the figure that you have for 2012 is, is that $80 billion? Yep. Out of a, uh, and that's money, that's inflows into Mexico. Yeah, that's, sorry, I mean, this is on page uh, 59. I'm just looking at it. It says $80 billion of trade misinvoicing out of a total export uh, I mean, Mexico's total exports are what, around 400 billion, I'd say, globally? So that's, that's... We are looking at which figure? So I'm looking here on table two, page 59, okay. 2012, inflows, trade misinvoicing. Yes. 79.839 right. right. billion, yes? Right. So that's almost 20% of Mexican trade. Sorry, Mexican exports. Well, it's, um, the inflows is 7.4% of Exports would be, yes, I would exports plus imports. Also, you're saying total trade, right? Well, I, I, I'm just looking at the inflows. It seems like a huge figure that if it's 20% of all Mexican exports are response, or are misinvoiced, yes. or rather. Easily believable. Yes, it surprised me. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because the thing is that, you see, after what we found is that after NAFTA, yeah. misinvoicing has in fact gone up rather than before NAFTA. Because uh, I'm thinking that, that's why I raised the question of customs reform, that it could well be the fact that the volume of trade has taken off exponentially, like you yourself mm. have noted. But I'm wondering whether customs resources and training mm -hmm. have kept pace with that huge right. increase in, in, in trade between the United States and, and, and Mexico. So it's entirely possible that they are not able to keep pace with the increasing demands of, of uh, a globalized trade. Right. Yeah. But, but again, what I think it's very important is to have this in the agenda. I mean, that, that 
This is considered one of the risks in the country. So the national risk assessment should be including this as, a, as an important risk. And this will help the assessors to understand whether the country has the mitigants in place to, to, to fight this problem. I think we have a question over here. Behind you. Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm a zoologist, and I look at all of this stuff that's been talked about today from an ecological perspective. Uh, Duncan, did you say something about the, the amount of money going into Mexico, illicitly flowing into Mexico, is about a, a, an additional half trillion dollars in the last uh, certain period of time? I didn't catch that. No. Um, what we've seen is that uh, bilateral trade between Mexico and the United States has increased to over half a trillion dollars a year. That's, that's formal trade between the two countries. Okay. Did okay. you say then, then what the illicit I'm not going in. So the, the problem is we don't really have a good uh, a good estimate. They vary from around 19 billion dollars a year um, up to some Mexican authorities have quoted 50 billion dollars a year. State Department says between 19 and 29 billion dollars a year, but they're not sure. I mean that's, that's a pretty big range there, um, and it's just it's very very difficult to get a, a handle on it. Um, now that would that's based upon the value of drugs that come from Mexico that are sold in the United States, okay? And then you, and this is why I think, you know, we have to take those numbers with a little bit of, of caution, because let's say that the money that's coming back is around, well, let's be generous, let's say it's $30 billion a year. That money, of course, is then spent on a lot of things. It's spent upon, you know, your human capital, your human resources. It's spent upon, spent upon product, so a lot of it, uh, as Concepcion uh, indicated, goes not to Mexico, but goes to a third country, either which is the source country of cocaine, for example, or to an offshore financial center, which is then redistributed to pay for the product. Um, and then we think about all, you know, all of the other costs that are involved. And you know, I mentioned this earlier on, but if you look at an organization like the Sinaloa Cartel, it's a very, very sophisticated organization. Um, they put a lot of money and planning into things like building tunnels not just to get El Chapo out of jail, but, you know, more importantly, to get their product underneath the U.S. border. Um, you know, another reason why walls don't really work, because you get long ladders and deeper tunnels. Um, but, you know, that's, I mean, these are, these are businesses, and they're constantly looking at ways to reinvest the profits to make more money in the future. So then what kind of alternative can you offer if, if you're going to stop a flow this big and you're dealing with a place where the income, the average income is, is so low, and you're talking about taking away what is a major right. source of income, you're talking about killing the big employer. I think, I think the, the point that you made there is, is a very, very good one. Now, nobody would want to say that drug cartels are the answer to development. But what you do find <laughs> in places like Sinaloa, I mean, if you go to the city of Culiacan, okay, and you hear all of the great, you know, the great stories, about, you know, people are in the restaurant Los Arcos, and, you know, a local drug lord comes in, the owner of the restaurant takes away everybody's cell phones, locks the doors, and says, you know, you're not allowed to leave until he's finished his meal. When he leaves, he pays everybody's bill, and everybody has a great story to tell. When you go to the local communities, the local community says, we don't actually want to do illicit work, but it pays a hell of a lot better than growing corn. You know, when you go up to the mountains of Guerrero, and you speak to the, the campesinos up there, they can grow poppies up there, which is a much, much better cash crop for them than anything that they can sell legally. And so you, when you talk to people, and I mean, after the El Chapo escape, people were saying, we're glad he's out of jail. This guy did more for us than the Mexican government has ever done. And that, you know, I mean, you, you, you don't want to exaggerate that. But yes, if you begin to interrupt the flow of money, then are you actually going to have a negative impact, particularly at the local micro level? Well, can I mm, follow up on these questions? Uh, on our paper, the paper we published on the impact of, on, of crime on the economy, we found that in some states, the, the impact was negative. In some, impact, in some states, the impact was positive and negative. So there are many nuances. Mm -hmm. What we found is that in those Mexican states where the construction um, so the construction versus GDP was higher, the impact of crime was um, less important. 
But if we think about what is involved in construction, you can also have uh, money from criminal activities going to the construction GDP. So mm -hmm. just to understand a little bit how it goes at the state level, at Mexican state level. And it was very interesting for us to understand that uh, we, we, we could isolate the response from crime in the economy on the construction sector. Yeah. Interesting. Great. Uh, Raymond Baker. Um, John Casara, who was with us yesterday and is a former customs agent, um, last week in a different context, uh, made an estimate to us that our attempts to, um, to get cash that is moved from the United States to Mexico arising from the drug trade uh, is estimated to succeed only to the extent of 25 cents on the $100. That's a, that's a quarter of 1% success rate. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that figure ever since then, and I can only imagine that that level of failure, uh, is, is it intentional on the part of the United States? Is it, um, uh, are we uh, making a minimal effort to curtail this for some political reason? I don't know how you operate a program with that low a level of, of success rate and, and pretend that you have a program in place at all. What's, how do you explain this? That? Is, is a really interesting point, I think, because if you, I mean, I got the figure from 2012, the United States uh, seized $2.5 billion, okay? Now, that's a tiny percentage of all of the illicit financial flows. Uh, the United Kingdom in the same period seized uh, around 317 million pounds, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and it was estimated to be, you know, exponentially much, much bigger than that. So if you think about what countries with functioning institutions can do, they're only capturing a tiny percentage of it. What can we really expect from countries like Mexico? And remember, Mexico is not Guatemala. Mexico is a country where things work pretty well. One of my first lessons when I moved to Mexico in the late 1990s, you know, I, like any other obnoxious expat, was saying, oh, my God, there's so many things that don't work in this country. And a Mexican colleague of mine came up to me and says, Duncan, the question is not why isn't Mexico more like the United States, is why isn't it more like Guatemala? And he said, That's, we are doing very well here, given the circumstances. And he was absolutely right. And so you begin to go down and you say, well, is this a battle that we're fighting and dedicating significant resources to that we have no chance of winning. It's kind of like the battle against or the war against email. You know you're never going to win that war, right? <laughs> but you keep fighting it day after day, okay? And in many cases, it's a war of attrition. In many cases, you try to minimize your losses. And maybe that's what it's about. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, they're going to find ways <clears throat> of doing it. In the same way, maybe I shouldn't say this here, but in the same way that financial institutions, legal financial institutions, will always find a way around regulations. Because that's the nature of the beast. It's about business. It's about making money. Just, yeah. just, question, I, uh, just one comment I want to make. You can reconcile your figures with our figures. Simple fact that these numbers here are derived from worldwide sources, yeah. not just U.S. Right. So, so there you go. I mean, so there are two different numbers. Yeah. So I know we're, we're close to closing, but we did start a, few start a few moments late. Maybe we can just get one last round of questions or comments from the audience, and then um, we'll ask uh, Concepcion and Duncan to give us their final comments. No? We had it. Really? Great. Well, is there anything <laughs> you'd like to add in I would terms like of the conversation? Add, yeah, I think we, we, here there is, there is missing a... Um, a point. Mexico, so the, the homicide rates in Mexico are lower than in other Central American mm -hmm. countries. And I, I think it's very important to raise this issue, to put things in context. The second is inflows, uh, illicit flows going to Mexico are, or, are also originating in other countries. I mean, you, you, you have the chocks to the economy in Mexico are originated at different points. So you have two different kinds of chocks, the ones created internationally and the ones created internally, you know, because of the changes in policy, wars against uh, 
uh, cartels and everything. So, I mean, it's not only Mexico that needs to take action, I think. Other countries need to take action to, to fight illicit flows. Uh, yeah. And just to build on, on what you were saying earlier on, I mean, I think that the strengthening of the judicial system in Mexico is going to be the single most important reform. We can talk about the energy reform in Mexico, we can talk about telecoms reform, mm -hmm. but the judicial reform is the single most important one across the board. I mean, even including economic development, I would say, in the country. Because it's about, ultimately, it's about uh, guaranteeing contracts uh, in many cases. Um, and you look at the challenges of that, and you look at the way that that uh, sort of applies directly to cases of corruption and the drug trade. You know, it's, it's amazing that when Walmart committed its acts of corruption in Mexico, it was not prosecuted in Mexico. It's been prosecuted in US courts and has paid the price and is going through the hell of the review process, okay? Um, Governor Yarrington from Tamaulipas has not been convicted, has not been accused in Mexico, but he's under uh, indictment in the United States for receiving drug money. And the fact is, until you can begin to see these kind of cases being tried within Mexican courts, we're not even close to getting there. And that's, again, why the judicial reform matters so much. Great. Well, thanks again to Global Financial Integrity for uh, pulling this conversation together today. And let's have a round of applause for Dr. Concepcion and Dr. Duncan for what they shared. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I want to quickly thank our uh, panelists again, uh, Dr. Verdugo, Dr. Wood, and uh, Eric LeCompte for uh, moderating the panel. Uh, we're going to break uh, one hour for lunch. We'll start again at uh, 2.20. Thanks. <laughs>